Hi, and welcome to Cases from the Coop. Uh, my name is Sarab Sodi, and I'm the current ultrasound fellow. We're going to talk through how to do a basic cardiac ultrasound today. So first and foremost, what are you really looking for when you do a bedside cardiac ultrasound? As point of care ultrasound people, we're not do attempting to replace a cardiology performed comprehensive echocardiogram. We're instead looking to answer some basic questions. We're looking to assess whether the EF is normal, hyperdynamic or depressed. We're looking to assess whether there is or is not a pericardial effusion. We're looking to assess whether or not there's RV strain. And then we're looking to see if there's aortic root dilatation and what the patient's preload is. So we're going to walk through how to do that with all of the different views that are present for bedside cardiac ultrasonography. So first and foremost, a quick reminder that any form of echocardiography that you're trying to do is looking to assess those areas and those questions that we discussed. You're looking to find the left ventricle, the right ventricle, sometimes the left atrium, and the aortic outflow tract. Now, as a reminder, with technical, technically, if you pick up a book, the book will tell you that if you're looking for a parasternal long axis view, you should simply plop the probe down in the second or third intercostal space, and that's where you'll find it. That's not always necessarily the case. So I teach people to start by putting a bunch of jelly down on the chest, usually right here under the clavicle, and then going searching. Because as you all know, different people with different pathology have their anatomy get shifted. So what that means is that if you have a patient who's got a large belly, not infrequently their heart will be way up high and you'll see a baristernal view in that first or second intercostal space. And conversely, if you have a COPD or, or an asthmatic who's hyperinflated, often the only views you'll get that look baristernal are down by the xiphoid process. So once you try to think about fanning through that space, that's the approach to do. Now a quick reminder is that I'm going to teach you orientation the way emergency physicians at Cooper Hospital do it. That's how most emergency physicians do it, but not all. And what that means is that we leave our probe marker on the screen on the left. And therefore, we use slightly different orientations. Okay? So, what you're going to do, as we discussed, is you're going to put that probe down on the chest with a bunch of jelly. You're going to start fanning out just lateral to the sternum, and you're going to start off at that first and second intercostal space. You're going to slide lateral, move down the next rib space, slide lateral, and continue. That probe marker will be pointed towards the left hip for the baristernal long axis view. And you're going to keep searching those spaces until you see this kind of view. So in this view, what you see here is that's your subcutaneous tissue. There's your right ventricle, which is the most superficial part of the heart. You see the left ventricle there. That's a papillary muscle. You see the left atrium. You see the mitral valve. You see the aortic outflow tract right there. And you see the descending thoracic aorta. So as we talked about all of your image, as we talked about all of the questions that we assess for, the parasternal long axis view is a great view to look for an effusion. One of the frequent things you can use to distinguish a pericardial from a pleural effusion is to look at the, uh, the aorta. If the effusion is superficial to the, to the descending thoracic aorta, it is l more than likely going to be pericardial. If it's deep to the aorta, it is more than likely going to be a pleural effusion. Secondly, this view is pretty good for estimating ejection fraction. Now, as you can see as well, if you're looking at that ventricle, you can see how well it's contracting. The normal ejection fraction is about 65%. You're simply looking to see whether it eject, whether the heart is contracting normally, whether the entire ventricle is coming together well, and the excursion of that mitral valve, all of which looks normal here. Additionally, this is one of the few views that examines the exit or your aortic outflow tract well. And there you can look for aortic dilatation. You can follow the rule of threes, comparing the the right ventricle to the aortic outflow tract to the left atrium. And if one of those looks bigger than the others, that may be an abnormality. So you found this view, you figured it out. What you do next then is you take the probe and you rotate it 90 degrees towards that right hip. And as soon as you do that, you'll slice through and get a view in cross section across the left and right ventricles. Now, as a reminder, you could do that at any level. So you could catch that right at the level of the mitral valve. You could catch it at the level of the papillary muscles, or you could catch it at the level of the apex. Now, your parasternal short axis view is great for figuring out ejection fraction, but the place you should assess for ejection fraction is at the papillary muscles. 
because your mitral valve annulus is fixed, so it'll always look like a depressed ejection fraction, and your apex is always hyperdynamic, which will make you think that the patient's maybe going to need some fluids when they may not be May, when they may not need or tolerate them. So you want to try to find the papillary muscles to assess for it. And this is what that looks like. So here you see a beautifully concentric, nice round left ventricle. You see it contracting normally and symmetrically. You see these two bright hyperechoic areas within it that are your, uh, that are your papillary muscles. And then additionally, posterior to it, you see the pericardium. And that's the RV up there, which is nice and small and looks like it's contracting well. It doesn't look like there's a ton filling through there, but you're not getting the best slice of it. Now, as a reminder, this view is good for an effusion. It's great for ejection fraction. And occasionally you'll see signs of RV strain, typically what's called a T sign, or sometimes you'll see interventricular dependence, all of which we can discuss later. Once you've gotten that view, you move on to what most people think is the scariest view, which is your apical four chamber view. Now, the apical four chamber view, Classically, you're told to find the patient's point of maximal impact. I've never gone looking for that to find it. The other way you're classically taught is to put the probe right underneath the, um, the nipple line in a man or in the inframammary crease in a woman. And we keep the probe marker pointing to its patient right. So once you put the probe there, here's what you'll see. You'll see, if you have it properly collected, you'll be sitting right over the apex of the heart. So you'll see the left ventricle here, you'll see the right ventricle on screen left. Additionally, you'll see the mitral and tricuspid valves perfectly in plane. If you have both valves perfectly in plane, that is a perfect apical shot. And then you will see down here, your left and right atria. Now this view is the best view for you to rule out right ventricular strain. What do I mean? I mean that if your right ventricle, which should be two thirds or less the size of the left ventricle is the same size as the left ventricle, and that would suggest you have right ventricular strain. So we use a one is to one ratio. That means that the right ventricle should be bigger than the left ventricle. And if you're not sure and you're trying to measure, you should measure across the valves at the, at the area, at the level of the valves, straight across the interventricular septum to compare the two. This view is often one of the most important views you can get. All of them are great, but this view in particular will give you a good view looking at what an effusion is doing to the heart, whether or not there is a large effusion, it's another good view to assess for ejection fraction, and it's essential for RV strain as we discussed. It's also the view you'll use for any advanced cardiac sonography, looking at things like left ventricular outflow tract, uh, velocity time integrals, trying to assess for volume responsiveness, as well as for more advanced Doppler applications like valvular disease. All right, and moving on, the last one, subxiphoid. Now, the subxiphoid view is the one that was always classically taught to emergency physicians. It was a part of the FAST exam. It is still an incredibly useful view. The places it is most useful are in your sick and dying patient where there's a lot of stuff going on in the chest. So if someone's doing compressions, this is a great way to sort of slip the probe under and look at the heart. Now, you slip the probe literally right under the xiphoid process. You angle the probe towards that left shoulder and you try to make your probe as flat as possible to follow the contour of the body. And you try to get your fingers out of the way so you can make the probe be almost flat against the patient. Now when you do that, you'll get a view that looks like this. You'll see the liver and then right there you'll see your right ventricle, you'll see your left ventricle, and then you'll see the left atrium and the right atrium. If you rotated that probe 90 degrees and had the probe marker pointing towards the head, you would get a beautiful shot of uh, the, in the inferior vena cava, which we won't discuss today. So we're going to tie this all together. So as a reminder, when you're doing the peristernal long view, you want to put the probe at the second and third intercostal space classically. But the way to find it is to put a bunch of jelly and then go searching this entire space systematically until you see the view that you're looking for. Now in this view, try to think about it for a second. You see, as we talked about again, the right ventricle, you see something between the right ventricle and that hyperechoic line. You see the left ventricle, you see the aortic outflow tract, and then you see the left atrium. We discussed the rule of threes, that left atrium looks a little big. We discussed ejection fraction, that heart really doesn't look like it's beating so well. There's the descending thoracic aorta, and there's some fluid, and there's a little fluid. So as a reminder, because this fluid pocket is posterior or deep to the 
descending aorta, that would make this <coughs> that would make this a pleural effusion. There is a small circumferential pericardial effusion as well. The ejection fraction is overall depressed as well. Moving on, as a reminder, for the peristernal short axis, you rotate that probe 90 degrees towards the other hip. And when you do that, if you were to see a view like this, you're seeing this nice crisp view of the endocardium, so that's a very adequate view. You're seeing right there your papillary muscle. Then you're seeing a right ventricle that looks like it may be a little generous, but as we discussed, we look for that mostly in the apical view. But instead, what you're seeing here is an ejection fraction that's quite low. The heart's barely squeezing, and there's barely any contraction. So this would be a depressed ejection fraction. Moving on to that apical view, as a reminder, you can either find the point of maximal impact, or you can go under the nipple line, or the inframammary crease for a woman, with a probe marker pointing to its patient right, and you will get this view. <coughs> On this view, again, you see that that left ventricle is really not squeezing in this view. You see that the valve is moving somewhat, but the ventricle itself, there's almost no movement of those uh, of the myocardium towards each other. The right ventricle looks reasonably sized, and then you can see the left and right atria as well. So this again in this clip would be a depressed ejection fraction. And now finally, you get a sub-xiphoid view. So in the sub-xiphoid view, you put the probe right under the xiphoid process and you get this picture. Now this picture is an example of what could be tamponade. You see an effusion, you see collapse of that right ventricle, and you're trying to figure out if that's in systole or diastole, which makes it challenging. We're not, I'm not going to tell you if this is tamponade or not. For that, you'll have to tune into the next round of lectures. But as always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out um, either in person or on Twitter at CooperEMUS. Thanks and have a great day.